My name is Catherine Wahome, as Aileen has said. And let me just say this, when Priscilla asked me to come and share, I wasn't quite sure what to share, what the story is. Um, and I've said actually one of my expectations today is to actually figure out if I do have a story after all. Yeah, so that's one of the things I'm hoping uh, to have figured out uh, today. So Priscilla, thank you. It is an honor to be here to share my story. Now I'm holding this phone because I said, I mean, I've got a very long story. So I asked, I don't know where to begin. So I've put some pointers here for me so that I don't go off completely. But let me just start from the beginning. Um, I'm a fourth born in a family of seven. And by the way, as I share, you hear me talk about many God moments because my life has been about God moments. A lot of leaders and a lot of people that I read about have very clear plans about what they want to do and they have plans and I am not that leader. Mine has been more of God moments than, than anything else and they started very early. So for me to be born number four in my family is actually a God moment, by the way, because I'm right bang in the middle. I have four, I mean three ahead of me, three after me. I have four sisters and two brothers. Now, the reason my birth order is significant is because I think it's played a part in who I have become. My mom, and I'm sure as the African woman she is, she wouldn't admit this. I think she'd really wanted to have boys because she was born in a family with just one brother. So my sister and I, who were born after boys, just had to learn to fend for ourselves because she often forgot us. So I'm younger than my brother, but when she left the village, I was born in Meru, uh, rural Meru, and that's where I grew up. She would actually bring my brother, who is older than me, and leave me behind. So one of the things you figured out, born after boy, you just, you just must fight for yourself. And perhaps that's where my fighting spirit uh, began. But growing up, I had just a normal upbringing and a pleasant one as well. Probably a little more privileged than what Nelson said, because I was born to teachers. Uh, my father was a primary school headmaster. My mother was a primary school teacher, which was a big thing then in the 70s. I mean, the teachers were eight. Um, so at least I could afford a pair of shoes going to school. I could afford an extra uniform going to school, an extra sweater. And that extra did get me into trouble because I learned very young to share. It's one of the things my parents taught me. And so in school in July, you know how chilly it would be before global warming? And so I would often give away my sweater because I had two. And there's this child who's come to school and, I mean, their shirt is actually red bare. They are shivering. And I've got two. So I'd end up giving all. And I went to school where my mother taught. So she would catch me at break with no sweater. But all hell broke loose when I lent and one time and I went back home with lice. And my mom had to boil and, you know, reboil. I often didn't wear my shoes because I felt I stuck out like a sore thumb because, you know, 99% of the school didn't have shoes, and you've got your shoes. So I had a privileged background, let me call it that, for our time. And I had parents that were very involved, which also played a major part for me. My father, I always say my father was a man ahead of his time, because he took time. And I mean, in that time, children were to be seen and not had. But every night, and I say every night, my father read bedtime stories to us. Uh, well, he didn't get into a bedroom, so we congregated somewhere in what was the sitting room then, and he read Bible stories to us. And was very big on reading as well. So the rainbow, for those who were born during my time, you know the rainbow magazine? That was a common thing in my house. And it was always a highlight. I think it came out once, once a week. So my childhood was generally pleasant with the exception of my brother, who made my life a living hell, but I'll not share that now. We are very good friends now. Uh, my brother was a bully, and I followed him wherever he went, and he didn't like that I followed him because I was a girl. Uh, so I got quite a fair amount of beating, but anything a boy that age could do, I could do. I did go cutting. For those who know, go cutting made, you know, the local way, not the ones you buy. I did go cutting using, you know, the bananas, you know those ones? Anybody knows those? I did, yeah. And um, what were some of the things perhaps that were picked about me very early? Perhaps I would say leadership. From very, very early when I was in lower primary, I got called upon when there were guests at the school to give a vote of thanks. 
Um, then I didn't think about it as leadership until much, much later. Um, I just thought it's because I was loud, I was bold. Uh, and like I've said, I went to the school where my mother taught, and that gave me a lot of guts. I bullied boys who are double my size and double my age during break, and then at 4 o'clock I walked to the staff room to go home with my mother, and I would still stick out my tongue to them as we went home. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if the younger ones may not know this, but there was the thing of tutafunga nawewe. I, I topped that list many times, but they never fungered with me because I followed uh, my mom. Now, in terms of early life school, and this is for me another God moment, uh, we had nursery school. I didn't go to nursery, not because I wasn't supposed to go, but I actually don't know why. I mean, my colleagues would come, let's go to school, and I say, I've not had lunch. And nursery school then was in the afternoon. My older siblings have been home, had lunch, and are gone away. So, of course, going to class one, I wasn't supposed to go to class one. But there's no way I was going to go back to nursery school. So, thankfully, around that time, my brother was going to class two and he needed a new uniform. And I knew this was my opportunity. So, the day that my mom came from school and they were supposed to go and get the uniform, I knew this is the day to follow them. But remember, my mother is a teacher. Teachers are very respected. As children, you're supposed to be the epitome, you know, in cleanliness, character, kill a kid if you're a child of a teacher. So there's absolutely no way I was going to follow her to the shopping center, dress the way I was dressed the whole day. Those days we had week clothes and Sunday clothes, you remember? Anyhow, I trailed them behind. So anytime my mother would turn, I would dash into a little bush, allow them some distance, then follow them. And I'm sharing this as a God moment, because when we go to the tailor, the tailor is actually the one that persuaded my mom and said, why don't you just make the uniform for her anyway? It will last more than a year. So if she doesn't hack it in class one, she can repeat. So my mom wasn't very happy, gave the story of why I'm not even going to class one. But anyhow, I got my uniform, but not without an ultimatum. So my mom said, let me tell you, you get to number 10. We are not even negotiating. You are repeating. So I went to class one, narrow escape. I was number eight. <laughs> but she was still persuaded that I should repeat. But another God moment, I had a teacher that just loved me, absolutely. And so she talked my mom out of getting me to repeat. And that's how I found myself in class one. Then fast forward, like I've said, my dad was an educationist, so very big on education. So a lot of us went to boarding school. But how did I go bo to boarding school? Didn't have to do the interview. I went courtesy of my older sister, who had been in the school, very well behaved. I mean, followed all instructions. And so when my dad went for the results, the headmistress said, if you have another one, bring. Now, what she hadn't bargained for is that I was nothing like my sister. I wasn't that child that you tell this and they do. So any trouble that could be had in that school, I was in it. Noise making, top of the list. One of the things we did on Saturdays was to prepare rice for Sunday. You know, the, it never used to come polished and clean for cooking, if you remember. And we weren't supposed to eat it raw, but we ate it raw anyway. So was anybody found eating the rice raw? I would be there. And so they were very frustrated because they were expecting my sister, but they didn't find my sister in me. And that was a very good lesson for me as well. One, being in HR later in life and being a mother. That you just must allow people to be who they are and then nurture them in the space. You find them. Because if you try to make everybody a carbon copy of everybody else, one, you will struggle. They will struggle. And I think life will be boring, isn't it? Okay, so that was basically my early life. Those are some of the pleasant or maybe not so pleasant memories that I have of my early life. Uh, growing up in a family, one of the highlights I always remember, and I'll share this because it's become key for me as a parent as well, is traditions. And one of the biggest tradition we had was Christmas. My parents were very big on Christmas. They passed it on to us. And for us, 24th was always such a highlight. So we sent our parents to sleep very early, and we were left to decorate the house. And the idea was always when they wake up the following day, they'll find a transformed, a transformed house. That was one. Then there was a particular Christmas um, carol that was very popular in our house. So there was always the competition on 25th. Who will be up the earliest to play it? And as you can guess, my dad always bet us. 
to the game. So those are some of the things that I always remember and going to visit aunties and having, you know, those sleepovers that came over the holidays. And for me, those are key because I find without even thinking about it are traditions that I have passed on to my children. And my family is very big on that. And I thought it's been very useful in keeping them together. So let me just fast forward to beyond primary school. I went to just local um, high schools. Um, I went to Narumoro Girls, a school right at the heart, the foot of Mount Kenya, if anybody has ever heard about it. We actually used to shower with ice, melted ice. And for the first three lessons in the morning, we couldn't have any lesson where you need to write. Because your fingers are blue. You can't write. So a lot of what we did is maybe mathematics, maybe literature. Things that didn't require you uh, to write. And if you needed to go anywhere, from Narumoro to Nyeri Town, if you missed the one pickup that pried that route on market days alone, you had to walk everywhere else, you went. So even when you're sick, we walked five kilometers to the nearest dispensary, right? We didn't have power. I mean, it was a hard life. So when I moved from my A-levels to Kaga Girls, it was like heaven. Yeah, you are in a school that is very close to town and, you know, there is the respect and all that. So that's where I did my high school in Kaga Girls. And then I went to Kenyatta University where I did my BCom and later on to Nairobi University uh, for my MBA and then a short stint at the Cambridge University in the UK uh, for a master's in philosophy. Now, let me get to the career space. Was I very clear about what I wanted to do career-wise? No, I had no clue. Because the story we were always told is you study hard and pass well. But nobody ever asked, so you pass well then? What next? So actually, even when I did my A-levels, I didn't know that you can pursue a BCom without having done economics or mathematics. So another God moment. So the career coordinator sees I had actually chosen law, BA, 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 because then we used to have four choices. But he says, so why don't you choose BCom? And I say, but I've not done math and I've not done economics. And he says, you do not actually need those subjects to do a BCom. So that's how I got myself to actually doing a Bachelor of a Commerce degree. And allow me to share this. So I go to do my Bachelor of Commerce degree and we have a business studies class. And the lecturer asks us to define demand. And these students put up their hand. I have never forgotten that definition. And they say demand is the willingness to buy, backed up by purchasing power. Now, that was the first time I was hearing the word demand in that context. <laughs> okay? But there's a student that even has the definition. Then the next class was statistics. And the lecturer comes and there's dy, dx. And he's doing the maths and the differentiation and so on. And then a student puts up their head and say, teacher, you've made a mistake somewhere. I have no clue. I'm completely lost in the forest. So the next day, a friend and I decide we are going to, then we were at JKU Arts, as because we were doing BCom. We decided we are going to KU because this thing is really not meant for us. And we wanted to go and do B.A. And the, the registrar, I hope you're picking another God moment there. He said, but you cannot be moving from, actually we weren't even going for BA, we were going for BA. He said, but you can't be moving from a professional course to a general course. Now for that kind of movement, you'll actually need approval, I think, from the dean. So they made it very complicated. And I remember us going back with my roommate, who is still my friend to date, and we said, you know what, we are going to hack this thing. And we just got down to it. And I say this with a lot of humility, just to encourage somebody who thinks they can't do something. I actually graduated top of my class in spite of wanting to quit. And I still remember when my results for first year came, I don't know if you've ever looked at your transcript and checked your name again to make sure it is yours. Because I was actually not studying to excel. I was studying to survive. Because there's business studies, there's statistics, there's accounts. The only thing that made sense to me was behavioral science. At least those ones I could understand what they're saying. Everything else was almost Greek. Then there was law, business law, and you've got to cram and you've got to quote, yeah? 
still in the degree now comes the decision moment of are you going to pursue accounting? Are you going to pursue marketing? Because those were the only two options then. And if you recall those who are in my age group, if you did a BCom and you didn't do accounting, you're actually wasting your time. Really? And this for me is maybe something somebody can carry out because my friend and Aileen knows her, she's called Regina. So now we are sitting in the room. It's the eve of making this decision and you really must make the decision. So are we going to pursue something we really don't enjoy? Or are we going to pursue something that we enjoy and say, whatever happens, happens? And you know, when you're in trouble, you can be very philosophical. I don't, I don't know if you know that. And I, still, I remember my friend Regina saying, you know, I would rather be head among rats than be tail among elephants. I don't know if anybody... And that for me, my decision was made. And I said, you know what? I enjoy marketing. I'm going to do marketing. At least I can enjoy my life in campus. I will worry about the job later. And I went on to do marketing. And again, topped my class in that particular program. And I didn't have to look for a job. People came looking for me to get a job. And if I share one of my insights, that's actually one of the insights I have picked through life. Just be. Just be who you are. Because when you're, you're authentic, you the core you, you actually will not struggle. I would actually have done accounting if I wanted to, but it would have been an absolute nightmare. But believe it or not, even after not doing accounting, I actually went to interview to work for PwC. For, it was then Pricewaterhouse. And I went all the way up to the partner interview. And I always call this another God moment because I remember the partner asking me, and he said it very slowly. I'll not say his name because you will all know who he is. He said, Catherine, you did become, I said, yes. You had the option to do accounting, I said, yes. But you chose to do marketing, I said, yes. And then he said, and now you want to be an auditor. And all those things we all say in interviews, you know, no, you know, sir, the first degree is just for opening up your mind. You can be whatever you want to be. But at the time I walked out, I knew I didn't have that job. But I am so grateful to God that they didn't give me that job because I would have done it, I'm sure. But I would really, really have struggled. And I would have been an absolute nightmare to my manager because my heart would have been in the right place, but I would never have delivered. Because for me, debit and credit, and all the accountants in the room, maximum respect, I kept thinking, why must it be a debit? Why must it be a credit? And then in my mind, credit is when I am old. <laughs> you know, so that, that science just didn't make sense to me. And I said, let me do marketing. Marketing, all you needed to do then were four Ps. And it didn't matter what shape the question took. The four Ps had to come somewhere, isn't it? I hear now they're about eight or more. And so that's how I ended up doing a BCom. That's how I ended up doing marketing. That's how I ended up landing my job. And actually, as a result of that, that's even how I ended up going to Cambridge without another God moment. My dean sent my name to Cambridge University without my knowledge. And so I get home and I get these documents from Cambridge University I have no clue what they are about. And so I go to KU. And my dean says, oh yeah, we have a certain MOU with Cambridge University and we send them our top students. And that's how I went to the UK, totally unplanned. Yeah, because I mean, it came, it's Cambridge anyway, fully sponsored. That's how I found myself doing my uh, MPhil, Master of Philosophy. But prior to that, there had been another God moment, how I did my MBA. So you know, we are told work very hard get very good grades so that you can get a job. My good grades actually made it difficult for me to get a job. Because the places I went to, they told me, this course of years, we know you're going back to school. But I was very clear I didn't want to go back to school. Those who went to university in my years we used to be called TTYs, tired third years. So the last thing you want to see is books. But I've knocked doors and Three, four times I'm being told the same thing. You, from your performance, we know you will go back to school. And then one idle afternoon as we are tamaking with my roommate, the elephant and rat lady, we stopped by Kenya Times to say hi to a friend of ours. 
And then he tells us, you guys, I used to see you in the library a lot. Have you considered doing your master's? We said, no. Then he says, let's walk across to University of Nairobi. There's a friend of mine there. He's the one who manages the master's program. And we walked to the University of Nairobi. We found they were actually wrapping up the box that had the applications because they had closed. But this friend said, no, you must hold on for these two girls. So the following day, bus stop, Meru, because you had to have your, the district commissioner sign for you and so on. And I brought my form back. I was in KU, but I actually got a scholarship from Nairobi University to pursue my master's degree. So when I say God moments, note it wasn't in my plan. This gentleman has come. And I say, what can it, I mean, it can't hurt, can it? I go apply, and I not only get an admission, I actually get a scholarship. And there were people from University of Nairobi in my class that were paying for themselves, right? So anyway, so that's why I said the story is very long. I don't know where to. So fast forward, I, I get, once I've done my MPhil, because I did my MBA and went straight to the MPhil. So I get a call from a friend of mine. I was actually at the airport clearing my luggage. And see, that's Deloitte. She says, we've got openings. Can you, can you come and see the MD? Because I told her I'm back, I'm looking for a job and so on. And I thought I would have enough time to go home, change. Because of course, if you're going to airport to clear cargo, you're quite not dressed for an interview, right? But by the time I cleared and everything, no time. So it was from JKIA straight to Deloitte for an interview with the MD. So you can imagine what frame of mind I was in, but thankfully... I got the job, worked there for a while, moved to PwC, and then went back to Deloitte as their human head of human resources, which I did for about 11 years uh, before I stepped out to do my own things, private consultancy. And I was in the process of doing that. That's actually where I met Aileen. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because we met at a client's who I had been working for for a while, and they wanted to contract Aileen as a coach. So I'd actually been called in to listen and assess. Okay? And we met, and we had a conversation as we walked out. She told me what she does. And I think Aileen, it must have been maybe a year or so down the line. Again, I felt I really wanted to do something different. One of the things I've discovered about myself, by the way, along the journey, is I'm very much a project person. I will be excited about things from year one to year four. By year five, it's driving me mad. So if there's, not, if there's no change, if there's nothing new coming, I will struggle. So actually when I met her and we were talking about season, I was in that season of I need to be doing something different, something impactful, something that actually changes people's lives. Because you see, I mean, HR is great, but after all these reports, then what? What difference is it making to anybody's life, even in the space of consulting? So that's how we had a conversation. And the lady that I was supposed to assess actually became my teacher. Yeah, so I, and typical of me, I'm, like I've said, I'm not one of those people that plan out to the last detail. Eileen will tell you, I think I called you at 11 p.m. Because that's when for me it crystallized that I really do need to do this thing that Eileen has been telling me about. So I picked up the phone, 11. I'm a night owl. So most of my conversations happen at night. So I'll be sending reports at 3 a.m. I'm not a morning person. That's why when Priscilla called me, I said, all the leaders I read about wake up at 4 a.m., are doing stuff at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. I am doing mine at 3 a.m. because I have been awake. Then I will sleep until 10, 10 a.m., the, the other way around. And that's how I got into coaching. And I have to be honest that perhaps... I've been through a lot of programs, as you can imagine, in those years, because I've been in the workspace for over a quarter century. But if there is a skill that I found totally transformational, it was coaching. Because coaching is not about work. Coaching is about your everyday life. And when I've shared in class when I teach, because I went on to actually now work with Aileen uh, to, to, to train, I say I've actually applied coaching more in my personal space than perhaps I have applied it in the workspace. Now, one of the things I should have said at the beginning is I'm a mother. I'm a mother of three young men, 25, 22, and 17. 
And I always say most of the lessons I have learned in life about managing people have not been from school. They've actually been from those three young men because they are like night and day. My firstborn, and, and I, I know there's power in the tongue, so I used to call him Al-Shabaab. I stopped because there's power in the tongue. But it's just these children that just want to create chaos. I mean, my son, even small, he would fight you quite. He will knock that glass for no apparent reason. My second born, we call him Kofi Annan. You know, Kofi Annan is the, the peacemaker. So when there would be trouble, it says, okay, mom, he can have. I don't think he's much of a Kofi Annan anymore. He's like, learns to fight his own battles. My little one, no longer little, 17, was more like a blend of the two. A politician to the core, I think. He'll either be a politician or a lawyer. Because my son will argue out, you know, almost anything. And when he can't win, when he was younger, he would tell you, no, my mom, my opinion can't be wrong. And that's how I would lose the battle. So he was sort of a blend of the two. And what coaching taught me is if I try to apply a one size fits all to the three, I think by now I've killed my firstborn. Yeah. But you really just learn that is your character. And so you learn to listen. And, and as Eileen said, perhaps one of the greatest skills I picked is the power of listening. I don't know if you've noticed when somebody is just talking and you're not saying anything. And I think we keep thinking maybe you've not heard or maybe you've not understood, so they keep talking. And that's how I would get information from my son, by just looking at him and nodding, not saying anything, then he will say the next thing, so he will actually tell on himself. Um, one of the things I learned from my firstborn, if you allow me to share, is do not issue threats unless you can execute them. So when he was in high school, he got into this habit of going to, for sleepovers without saying, mostly he would be at my brother's place. And in the typical African fashion, one day he came home and I said, you better go back to where you are from. And you know, had Zakimbo. And you know, he went. This is 8 p.m. in the night. So I'm thinking, okay, I can't quite call him to say come back because then it really dilutes my moral authority to say anything. And I can tell you, I sat in the house biting my nails and I'm thinking, so what's going to happen? Then maybe an hour, an hour and a half, my sister-in-law calls and says, your son is. And I said, that's now when I breathed. Easy. But there's no way I was going to call him and say, please come back. Because then what will I tell him? Tomorrow. But that's one of the lessons I learned. If you cannot execute, do not issue the threat. So from that point on, the threats to him were threats about money. I'll not give you money because he can't get to my bag and get the money. But I actually told him, go back where you came from without batting an eyelid. He turned and off he went because he can also push the envelope. And actually one of the things we realized is we are very similar because I'll not lose a fight easily. So we learned we argue over things that are completely useless because I must win. So over time we developed a code with him when we realized we are arguing for nothing, you lift your finger. You see, this is one of those arguments that is going, no, it's an ego argument, not a content, a content argument. So anyway, <laughs> let me go back to my career. So I have met Aileen, I have done coaching, I've gotten into the space of uh, coaching and I'm loving it. But again, the project person, because you're thinking, okay, I've done these trainings, it's the same content. The audience is different. And I think there's a year with Aileen, uh, we, we got so much work. I mean, we thank God. But at some point it was getting tiring because you sound like you're repeating yourself. And I knew I actually needed a change. I just didn't know where. So let me talk about my greatest turning points in my life. A bit sad, but uh, growth has come out of it. So for me, 2017, um, has really, really redefined my life. And those who know me will know I will talk a lot about 2017 because it gave me perspective that I didn't have. So 2017, I lost my husband. I don't say this in many forum, but I'll say it here because this is a forum for growth and this is a forum for believers. Many of you might know the, the late governor of Nyeri, Wahome Gakuru. Anybody? That is the man I was married to. 
And um, so he's become governor 2017. I have to recalibrate a lot of my life. That's, that's the time I was making an exit from a CDI. And then all of what, maybe 75 days in office, he dies tragically. Now, Aileen will tell you 2016, 2017 were very tough years in the business. There was actually no money coming through. So here I am, three young men, no spouse. Uh, and for those of you who kept abreast of the news, you do know the drama that followed thereafter. I'm a very, very private person, very. You, you will have to be, I have a friend of mine who calls me an onion. And he says, you know, I think I've known you for long, but every time we talk, there's a layer that, that, that comes out. And, and I'm just deliberate about it because I'm the kind of person when I go deep, I go very, very deep. So if things go wrong, they go really wrong. So I use the Jesus model. You know, Jesus had 70, he had 12, and he had three. So the three, and Aileen is, is in that room of the three, that's why she wasn't sure what to say, will know me inside out, because those are the people that will receive my calls when there's something very deep I need to share. So for me, I was in a space that I was dealing with a lot. I'm dealing with death, I'm dealing with children that I need to take care of. At that point, I had a son in fourth form. Actually, when his dad died, he had just done one paper. And so I had to go to Alliance to go and, you know, deal with that as well. So there's that, there's the media to deal with, there's the press to deal, I mean the media, yes, there's the government to deal with because now he no longer belongs to you, he belongs to government. And I see on the day he passed on, I was just going to work. And when I went back to my home in the evening, I couldn't even recognize my home because there are tents. And then there are all these men and women who I only see on TV. I am now seeing them in real life. My sitting room has been reorganized. Nothing was where it was. But what have been my lessons from 2017, in spite of the pain, is you're actually a lot stronger than you think you are. You are a lot stronger than you think you are. And if you can keep your mind on what matters, because for example, with all the media buzz, and thanks to coaching, some of the questions I ask myself is, who really matters in this whole equation? The people that matter is my family and the three that I have talked about, maybe to a limited extent, the 12. The 70 at that point don't quite matter. Do they know the truth? They do. So life can, can go on because you don't owe anybody else any other story. Now, one of the other things I did that I didn't say about my life is I was also in Bible study fellowship for I think this, what, 14 years now, last year, this year I've stepped down and I was a leader for nine of those 14 years. And one of the things my teaching leader always reminded us is what you feed grows. If you don't feed it, it will not grow. And I got a lot of calls, including my father-in-law. My father-in-law saying, this Facebook you talk about, can you show me how it is done? I respond to these things. <laughs> and I, told, I said to him, you know what, that my battles are fought by, by God. But the key thing I kept remembering at the back of my mind is what you feed grows. So if you pick up that phone call, you think you're putting out a fire, but you're actually putting out a fire. Now, the other amazing thing about 2017 was I actually discovered things about myself that I didn't know. You know, media said stuff about me that I didn't even know. But from a testimony point of view, so what came out was very positive, incidentally. There's this lady, she's called, there's somebody who writes very hard-hitting pieces in the nation. I don't know if she still does that on Saturdays. And I remember a couple of my friends reading because she did a piece on, on me and they couldn't believe. But in the midst of all that, was what was supposed to be murky, what actually came out was, was positive. But what are the lessons I have taken out of? They have said we are stronger than we think we are. And then I also just learned to hang on to things loosely. Don't hold on to anything too tight because it can go away very easily. And I also learned that tragedy actually can open doors. You don't just have to look at it from a negative sense. As I talk to you today, my youngest, 17, I got a call on, I think, Tuesday, and one of his classmates actually lost the father. And the auntie called me and said, do you think your son, the boy is called Matthew, do you think your son can come and speak to Matthew? 
because he's walked this journey, so he probably will understand it better than. So is in that ministry. I've been called many times to actually just talk about grief and walk people the journey. And for me, I say they can benefit one person, then it was worth the pain that we went through. But that loss also ushered me to new territories. I didn't say where I'm working at the moment. I work for the government of Kenya, a Ministry of Public Service. It's now been uh, redefined, Ministry of Public Service, Gender and Affirmative Action. Now, how did I get there? I got there because the president made a commitment to give me a job. And when I got called, I really, really thought about it. I said, do I want to do this? Because all my life, by the way, I had avoided working for government. All my life. Whether it's contracts or anything of that sort. Um, and I spoke to a couple of people and I said, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I've, I've been self-employed. I've worked for multinationals. This looks like a good thing to have on my CV. And it's been an amazing, amazing journey. Yeah, and, and I keep saying, I tell Eileen, if you haven't worked for government, you haven't worked. You talk VUCA, you do not know what VUCA is until you get to government. And I now understood why government people carry newspapers and why government people must watch news. Because the president will make a pronouncement and it will affect your work plan. He's making it on TV, but it's going to have an impact on you. On your, on your work plan. So, so that really has been my journey um, career-wise. At my table here, when we were asked, what season are we in? I'm actually in a season of transition. I've just done five years in government, so my project is beginning to bite. And I'm just in that space, I'm saying I want to be in a different space. And when I began this year, one of the prayers I made to God is I want a positive disruption. And I added the word positive de disruption deliberately because I got a disruption in 2017 that has really recalibrated my life positively, to be honest. So I was careful to say, Lord, I want another disruption, but no, I'd not a 2017 disruption. I want a positive disruption. So I'm in that space of figuring where do I want to go next, but still in the space of impact. Where can I share my experiences? Where, where can I change people's lives? Because for me, my greatest satisfaction has always been, and that's why coaching has made a lot of sense, to sit with a person who thought they can't do it, a person who is really sad and downcast, and to see them walk out of my office smiling. And often not because I've given them a solution, but I've been a mirror to them to see what they can, they can do. That for me is what I consider my greatest achievement. So then what are some of the lessons I've learned, some of the insights, is work more at being than doing. Because, and, and I keep saying, that's why we are called human beings and not human doings. We are so big on just doing. So we get people into careers they don't enjoy. We get people into spaces they don't enjoy because we are afraid that the career I want will not, will not come. Like I said, I would have become an auditor. And by the way, I should have said, I actually later on went back to work at PwC, <laughs> but in consulting. And I met this same partner and he said, Catherine, you were determined to be here. I said, yes, I was determined to be here. And I went back, but through a different avenue that I was I was enjoying and one of the things I always tell my children is just be the best at whatever it is that you're doing and somebody will actually come looking for you, right? So that for me is one of the, the key lessons that I have learned. One of the other things I've learned through life is how do we grow? And, and when I trace back my own experiences from reading, it first of all begins with a desire. This is something that I want to do. I call them the three Ds of growth. There's desire, there's discipline, there's diligence. In my own experience, I have seen the discipline D is actually the toughest. The desire will be there. I want to be this, I want to be this, I want to be the other. But it is that D of discipline that is always an absolute nightmare. And if we can master that, then I think we'll be home and dry. I have also learned that through life, nobody's going to talk for you and nobody's going to fight for you. You've got to do it yourself. I grew up in an environment that I was taught modesty. I was taught to put others ahead of me. 
I was told to do a good job and the good job will speak for you. When I got to the real world, I realized that doesn't always work. The job will speak for you, but your mouth also needs to speak for you. Nobody will do the fighting for you. So don't sit at the tea place and gripe, which is what I used to do. By the way, at the point I changed my job uh, from PwC, I realized I'd become a person I didn't know. Because anybody I met, I was just complaining. I mean, we'd have a conversation and I guarantee you in the second or third minute I'll get into griping. And I remember one time meeting a friend and I spoke and I said, I really don't like who I'm becoming. And that day I went to the office and I said, if I so hate this job, I have two options. I either shut up, do it quietly, or I get out. And I said, I want the second option. And I kid you not, in under a month, I had a job. But the thing is, the whining space can be very comfortable. But do you rise up actually and do something about it? Because no one will fight for you. Nobody will speak for you. And I got out and when I started, I actually found, found a job. Now, I like what's Anampio. I think that's Anampio. I have a neighbor by that name, so I can't forget it. <laughs> so when she said about God, and, and, I, and I'm bringing it last, but it doesn't mean it is least. I'm bringing it to top up everything. You honestly must good put God first. If you do not, from where I sit, and this is not Christianese, it is reality. Nothing is really going to run. And maybe for me, because I've seen a lot of God moments in my life, even when I left my job at Deloitte, a lot of people couldn't understand. I mean, you've risen this high. This is a very respected organization. Where are you going? And that's why I said, unlike other leaders who I'm quitting because I am very clear. Actually, I had to be very honest. I didn't know where I was going. I was just tired. And I knew I needed something different. And one of my signals that it's time to leave is I start struggling to go to work. I wake up in the morning and I ask myself, must I? That for is usually the first red light that is time now to begin. To, because one of the things God has been very gracious to me about, I have enjoyed virtually any job that I have done. So when I wake up and I'm thinking, should I go to work, should I not? I know that for me is the signal. So when I left Deloitte, I had nowhere specific that I was going. I just knew I needed like three months rest, clear my mind. I did actually interview in between and I thought to myself, if I transition to anybody's employment, in this frame of mind, I'll actually not be fair to them. So why don't I go away, clear my mind, figure out exactly what I want to do, and then perhaps I can go to this, back to the space of, of work. Well, I didn't do the three months. Um, it was a lot shorter. There's a friend of mine I kept telling I'm quitting. So I remember him telling me one day, you, when you finally quit, let me know. So actually, even when I quit, he didn't believe. I had to send him my, my letter as, as evidence. And then he had some work he was doing, and then that's how I launched myself into consulting. So I think, Priscilla, when you're talking about the power of networking, that for me is actually key. Because a lot of the work I did in consulting was purely from networks, unexpected networks, which is also a God moment. Because when you tell people you're quitting, they tell you, yeah, come, come, let's work. All the ones who told me, come, let's work, I think only one gave me work. All the other work I did was in a forum like this, I'm presenting something, we meet, we exchange cards, and then, and then work comes through. So it's really putting God uh, first. I was speaking to somebody today who was asking me, so with the change of government, what does it mean? And I said, I don't know, because new people come with new things, but that for me has never worried me. Because, you know, she joked and said, I thought I would see your name on the CS. And I said, well, I didn't give it a thought, but I can guarantee you, if there's a CS sitting in my docket, they will be out and I'll sit on that docket somehow. I don't know how. If there's, if there's anybody occupying space that I should be occupying, I know without a shadow of a doubt, they will get out and I'll occupy that space. Because scripture says he brings one down to bring another one up, isn't it? Yeah. But I'm not praying that anybody gets fired. <laughs> I'm just saying if they are sitting in my space, they will have to vacate it for me, isn't it? Because my purposes and the purposes that I need to achieve through that position uh, must be achieved. So Priscilla, I could go on and on. I think this sounds to me like a logical uh, place to put a stop. So if you don't take anything else out from me, 
just do more of being and less of doing is actually a lot more satisfying and just be authentic to yourself be true that rat and elephant thing has worked wonders for me whenever i'm in a space i can't decide that's actually the question i ask myself so let me go enjoy what i'm doing it may not bring the money but i'll not be cracking i'll not be cracking my head and of course god 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 all the way elin talked about me and scripture but my reading of scripture came from a moment of a very 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 wilderness space in my life and i tried many things and they didn't work and one day i went to my room and i told god you know he be believe he i am going to read it like a novel actually what i did is i went to keswick as i close a lean and i said now i want to understand this god and so i bought a study guide the study guide i bought was on corinthians and if you studied paul you know Paul can write tough things. So he's not a gentleman you want to study when you have been in the wilderness. So I got that guide, I looked at it, didn't make sense whatsoever. And one day I packed it and I said, you know, God, this thing, I'm going to read it like a novel. And I started from Genesis 1. And I can tell you, if you get that Bible, that was in 08, I have underlined scriptures even in Leviticus. There's, and, and I remember meeting with a friend of mine and we'd ask each other, have these verses always been in the bible because this is the same bible we've been reading but if you go to numbers deuteronomy leviticus there's not a single book of the bible that i have not i have not uh, underlined there yeah. and i'm glad i went into that space because then that was the beginning of everything that's when i went to bible school fellowship i know nelson is nelson is hearing some of these things for the very first time by the way he's the one who invited me into ministry i should have mentioned that one of my Likaribations after 2017 2018 I got into government the same 2018 actually the same month April I was are we elected are we appointed uh, elected as a deacon uh sitam um another very interesting story because I had always wanted to be as far as possible from church leadership because I had been with friends who said sometimes if you get very close you can backslide I would not say if you can or you can't you can see me after this so I tried to stay very far so how my name found its way there I do not know um actually at the point I was being called to give my papers I was very far a pastor had to wake me up on a Sunday morning <laughs> and that's how I sent my papers and the rest the rest is actually history so that's what I'm saying the spaces that god wants you to be in god will get you in those spaces somehow whether you're doing it willingly or unwillingly yeah. so i think let me close there i can go on and on and on yeah but uh, let me stop there thank you yeah. thank you so much Please, thank i i stay here enjoy your wonderful <laughs> seat um let's give a better hand clap she has shared from her heart shared generously